Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Peter's this morning. For those of you at home and those of you here gathered in the church, we will begin our service by singing hymn number 551, Rise Up, Ye Saints of God. everyone. We have a special guest with us this morning. Bishop Jim Curry is here and will be preaching on a special ministry that he has developed over these past few years. And so let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, for, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us join in the singing of the Gloria S. 277. Lord be with you, and let us pray together. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that, having this hope, 
we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for reading of scripture. The first lesson is from Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us read together Psalm 146. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have God of Jacob for their help. Who hope is the Lord their God who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord set the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord lives the righteous, and the Lord cares for the strangers. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. The second lesson is from Hebrews. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again, as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to resolve sin by the sacrifice of himself, to remove sin by sa the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Lord to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the name of the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promises forever. Amen. Good morning. It's wonderful to be back here with you all at St. Peter's. I took the long road today because I live in New Haven, so I drove up to Glastonbury and then down Route 2 and then over on 66. And no matter which way I turned, the sun at quarter after 6 was catching me right in the eye. Yeah, you know, that wasn't that much fun. And then I got here. And I remembered this parish and your windows that capture the light, the hope of God in, in just wonderful ways. And I was um, convicted of my bad thoughts coming up and just so happy to be here with, with this and to watch the play of the stained glass in here as we listen to the word of God as we share in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. I want to speak today about one of those promises of God, one of those promises that God holds true. It comes from the prophet Isaiah about 2,700 years ago. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. <sighs> it's an incredible statement of hope, an incredible statement of the kind of promise that God gives us. I remember talking with a lawyer once who wanted to tell me the distinction between the two words will and shall. Will it's a good word. Shell has in it the notion that it will come to pass. It has to. In a contract, you shall do something? Yes. So this is God's promise. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Isaiah made this promise in a time of incredible disarray in his own kingdom and in the world. Not dissimilar to the kind of life that we live in and in the midst of pandemic and in the midst of violence in our society. And I want to speak most especially about gun violence. It's almost wishful thinking to say they shall beat their swords into plowshares. It's almost that, except that it can't be because it's God's promise to us. And we have some kind of responsibility to do what we can about that. About five years ago now, I was part of a small group of people from the Episcopal Church and the United Church in, of Christ in Connecticut to start thinking about what innovative approaches, what symbolic statements might we start making after so many horrific gun deaths in this society of ours, and especially here in Connecticut. I mean, one fact that you may not be aware of is that over one half of all gun deaths are suicide by gun. Now, what do I mean by one half? We have over 40,000 deaths a year by gun. Half of them, more than half, are suicide by gun. Accidents. A young friend of mine a 14-year-old from Guilford was shot and killed playing around, as teenagers will, with a gun that wasn't securely stored in a home in a town like Guilford, a town not dissimilar from Hebron. The gun wasn't locked. The ammunition wasn't separated. The kids were playing, Ethan's song was killed. And we know crimes, horrific mass shootings. As bishops, Ian, Laura, and I officiated at the funeral of one of the children of Sandy Hook. I never again want to stand at a grave of a child killed in such a way. And yet, I have over and over and over again. In 1994, in the city of Hartford, a seven-year-old girl was asleep in the back seat of her father's car as they drove a, to take a gallon of milk to the grandmother. They parked on the street, and as they parked, another car came up, opened fire on them, and Marcelina Delgado was shot and killed. Her father was gravely wounded. Her mother and siblings were also in the car. They were spared, except, of course, for the trauma that's lived with them all their lives. The perpetrator said, oh, we thought that car was one that belonged to a rival gang member. That was their justification for shooting. They were arrested. They were put in jail. But I remember at that moment, I was rector sort of over the hills in Portland at that point, not in Hartford at all. But I remember that I was grabbed by that death like no other, and it might have been because my own twin daughters, who were five at the time, were used to falling asleep in the back seat of my car. I know that we missed an opportunity here in Connecticut. We always talk about tipping points. That was a tipping point that we missed. For a few days, it was on the TV, but we didn't follow up, and there are two reasons for that, I think. The first is that Marcelina was a child of color. She was a Puerto Rican, and she lived in the city. 
The other reason, though, is more systemic. It's that we don't, we can't, in a sense, carry with us the trauma unless we're willing to do something about it. If, if we just carry it, it becomes debilitating and eventually we're just gonna give it up. We're, we're gonna walk away from it because that's, that's what we do. In a sense, we did the same thing with Sandy Hook, in a sense. This last spring in Hartford, a three-year-old, Randell Jones Jr., was in the backseat of his mother's car as they were driving by the church that used to be our St. Monica's Church in the North End. A car came up next to it with the intention to kill somebody that they didn't like, and they shot into the car and Randell was killed. Another tipping point, we still, have, we still have the possibility to work on God's promise. About five years ago in Oregon, there was a, a priest who heard that the girls' softball team in his little town in Oregon wanted to go to a softball tournament in California. And so they had an idea, we're going to raise money and we're going to raffle off an AR-15, a semi-automatic rifle. And Jeremy Lucas thought, well, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. So he went to the team and he said, I'll give you the money for the trip if you cancel the raffle. Well, Oregon state law said they couldn't cancel the raffle. So Jeremy bought $3,000 worth of tickets, and he won the gun. And he said right away, I'm going to destroy this gun so that it can't be a, an instrument of harm. And he searched for a long time trying to find out, what, what can I do with this gun? And he found this little group in Colorado Springs, Colorado, a group of Mennonite men who after Sandy Hook said, we're going to do something concrete about this. And they started making garden tools out of guns that people gave them to destroy. And Jeremy took his gun all the way from Oregon to Colorado, and they destroyed it, and they made some tools. And I met Jeremy at a vigil of the victims of gun violence in Washington that year. And I was captured by the imagination. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Well, for our time, it can be, we shall beat our guns into garden tools. Neighbor shall not lift up gun against neighbor. Neither shall we learn violence anymore. We are bound in this society by violence. And yet what the image of Isaiah gives us is an idea that we're free. We're free to choose something different. And we're free to encourage other people to do that. Not require. I'm not about getting rid of all guns. But I am about gun safety. If people keep a gun, let's make sure they have the right locks, the right storage. Let's make sure they know how to use it. Let's make sure that people who, have, who, who shouldn't have them don't have them. That's... So we started Swords to Plowshares here in Connecticut. And what we do is we work with police departments and communities all across the state to invite people to bring in their guns. Most of the time it's a buyback, so you get a sliding scale of uh, gift cards depending on the guns you bring in. And then I'll work with the police department. I did this actually yesterday in New Haven. I'll go with the police. They have the record of all the guns that come in. They keep that record. And together we destroyed those guns so that they could never be used again. And then they give us 
the material, and we do two things with it. We give it away to artists who can make sculptures, and that's much more ability than I have. And we use blacksmithing skills to transform those weapons into garden tools. And then we give them away. We give them away to church gardens, community gardens across the state, um, school gardens, uh, programs around the state that are called violence interruption programs that are working with teenagers and young adults uh, to break the cycle. We have wonderful community gardens in some of the toughest neighborhoods in New Haven. And those community gardens are using our tools and talking about this process of transformation as they make food available to give out to the community in these neighborhoods. Today, we're going to share some of that here. The forge is set up, and we're going to be making some tools. And the other thing we're going to be making today are little, now they're souvenir hearts, souvenir necklaces. The hearts are made from rings of a shotgun barrel that I've sawn. So it's about the size of a wedding ring. And we'll use the forge and the anvil to shape that into a traditional looking heart. Because, as a friend of mine always wants to say, not only do we have a gun violence program, a problem, a gun problem in this country, we have a heart-focused problem. And this little souvenir is going to be a, a reminder of the transformation that God is seeking in all of us. Neighbor shall not lift up sword, gun against neighbor, neither shall we learn violence anymore. Our ministry came out of an ecumenical setting. It also came out of one of the networks here in the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, the Swords to Plowshares Ministry Network. And the, the diocese has helped us uh, through this program to get the equipment we need to do this work. And you'll notice we now have a trailer which allows me to, and others to come to places like Hebron uh, to bring and to show. Um, a week from next Tuesday, at the invitation of Senator Blumenthal and Representative DeLauro, my congresswoman in District 3, uh, we're going to Washington, D.C. We're going to set up the forge on Capitol Hill and invite their colleagues. They, they want their colleagues to see this um, and uh, to maybe grab onto the vision themselves. One last thing I'd like to talk about today, very quickly, is the stole that I'm wearing. I, I, I can't imagine that some of you don't have questions about this. Uh, orange is not a traditional liturgical color. About a month after, maybe six weeks after the uh, mass shootings, the tragedy, the atrocity in Sandy Hook, a young woman, a teenager from Chicago by the name of Hydea Pendleton, who had, by the way, just come home from uh, being at the second inauguration of President Obama and had played in her school band for that parade. She was sitting in a park in Chicago talking to her friends, and she was shot and killed by a drive-by shooting. She was 15. And her friends gathered together and said, what can we do to, to, to celebrate her life, to mark her life? And what they came upon was Wear Orange Day, which is on June 2nd of every year now, because that's Hydea's birthday. And they invited people all over the country to wear orange. Now, orange 
is the color of safety, isn't it? It's the color that hunters wear out in the fields so that they don't get shot. So that's what this stole is about. It's, it's our ministry of safety, safety for our children, safety for those vulnerable among us, safety for our communities, safety for our na- neighborhoods. And I do this in honor of Hadia, um, but also in honor of those incredible teenagers on the south side of Chicago. We most often think of them as the core of violence. Well, these kids are not. These kids are at the forefront of rethinking symbols in our lives that can help us move from violence to peace. That's what Isaiah is all about. That's God's promise. We shall beat our swords into plowshares. This is an example of that. This comes from the country of Mozambique. After their terrible civil war, when almost everything in the country was destroyed, the bishop of the Anglican diocese, a dear friend of mine, Denise Sengalani, said to artists, well, first he said, we've got to get the guns in from our countryside. That happened. In a buyback, they gave out things that people could use to build a new life. But then he said to artists, make signs of hope. And a group of artists made this tree of life. It, it's actually taller than the uh, chandelier here. The trunk is made out of welded together guns. The branches are the barrels of AK-47s and the leaves of the trees are the magazines of that semi-automatic or automatic weapon. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. The last thing I want to share, and I know I've gone on, but I was working with a teen group in Hartford this summer, an interfaith teen group from all over Hartford and surrounding area. In fact, I know in the past, Some people from Hebron had joined this camp. I don't know if it was true this year. But I brought the forge, and we spent a day uh, banging on guns, making hearts, making tools. And at the end, one of the leaders of the camp gave me this icon. It's Jesus, the blacksmith. Jesus at the forge, hammering a sword into a plowshare. It's not quite historically literal, it's not Isaiah, but it is Jesus, <laughs> and it is who Jesus is. And that's, that's the hope that we have. That's the hope I want to convey today, even in the midst of all, of all of the trauma, the tragedy, the despair of gun violence. There is the hope we have in a God that keeps promises. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn to page 358 as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people form four. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Bless those celebrating their birthdays this week, especially Andrew Savage, Barbara Parkham, Tom Atwood, Donna Lee Kay, and for all those celebrating anniversaries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We remember especially baby Connor, Amy Stone, Eileen, Jim, Sue Deniker, Betty Glukowski, Laura Bodwin, Betty Dombrowski, Nelson Moore, Dan, and those who are listed in the continuing prayer list. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Trinity Weathersfield, St. Paul's Willimantic, St. Matthew's Wilton, all deacons in the Deacons Council, and the Province School for Deacons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, and for what else shall we pray this day? I'm asking your prayers for Connor, who is a six-month-old grandson of Loretta and Tom Dickey. They are former members of this church. He has three very serious things wrong with him. I can't even pronounce the names of what they are. But he's had a major surgery this week on his fibula and his heart. So I ask for your prayers for him all this week. I ask you to keep in your prayers the Reverend Jackie Sheldon, who is the rector at St. Paul's Willimantic. Her son David died of a stroke 
and his funeral was yesterday in Niantic for David and his family. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. First of all, we're delighted that Bishop Curry is with us to share his work in his ministry, which is all over the state and beyond. And so our first, the first Sunday of each month is a special collection. Anything in the loose plate will go to support Bishop Curry and his important ministry that he takes everywhere in the state to parishes and other groups. So please be generous. And at this time, I would like to invite members of the Garden Committee to come forward, please. I am very happy to report that this week we actually settled on the land next to the parish hall. We are now the proud owners of 16 and a half acres of land with the open field and, and possibly there will be space for some community gardens so we can put our garden committee and that tool to some really good work. So th that'll be helpful. And on that score, we have set a date of December 7th. It's a ways away, but I'm asking folks to put it in their calendar early. It's a Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. There will be dinner and conversation. We've shared what the vision is for the land. Now it's time to get down to some more brainstorming and dreaming and specifics. So we're going to have a parish-wide meeting that we said we were going to do when we had our first one. So hopefully. Put that on your calendar and there'll be more information forthcoming in the next little while. 
As many of you know, our sister parish in Norwich Christ Episcopal Church has closed, and we have become the beneficiaries of their choir robes. But another thing is happening. You will notice two pews are missing here. They've been set in the back, and Chuck Eaton says, when you're misbehaving, you'll get sent to the back there in those pews, so you better behave yourselves. But in any event, we are getting a beautiful Mason and Hamlin baby grand piano from Christ Church in their music school. We'll arrive tomorrow by around noon, and we will have a wonderful instrument here that can be used to accompany our choir and to actually be able to do concerts here in the space because the acoustics in here are very good for music groups and so we are looking forward to you know, being able to use this space in addition to worship for, for musical events of all kinds. So that instrument takes us a long way down that pathway. So we will put a little plaque on it acknowledging the people of Christ Church and thanking them for their faithfulness for all of these many, many, many decades. Um, so um, we will be doing that. Um, we also have in the back of the parish, the, the, on the table, a number of sign-up sheets, both for the Saturday's dinner. It's our roast tender, pork tenderloin dinner this Saturday, and there's still a few spots available for signing up. And also we're beginning to do sign-ups for various things related to the St. Nicholas Fair, which is going to be the first weekend in December. So please take a look at that list. Uh, three more quick things. One is that the churches here in Hebron, along with the synagogue, will be doing an in-person Thanksgiving service together on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. It will be held at Holy Family Catholic Church, which is the largest space we have among the churches that will allow us to um, worship more freely and have more space. So that's where we will be gathering again, the first time we've done that since the pandemic in person. So we're delighted with that. Um, also a reminder that we have mailed out pledge cards to everyone in the parish um, and our entire mailing list and the, the vestry is just beginning to imagine the budget so if you haven't returned your pledge card we invite you to do so. And lastly, thanks to the good efforts of our, one of our newer parishioners, Chip Ide, who's in the choir over there. We are working on helping be part of a coalition out of Glastonbury. It involves three congregational churches, the Jewish synagogue, a Catholic church, and the Manchester Rotary. We are partnering together to resettle an Afghan family. We have a four bedroom apartment in Manchester, and Chip is one of the co-chairs of the furniture committee as we move forward with this um, effort. So I'm grateful for Chip's leadership in this area. The other thing is, is thanks to Barb Parkin, our treasurer, we have also taken on the additional responsibility of becoming the fiduciary for the project. In other words, we're the bank. So the fundraising group that does the fundraising, we sends the money to us, we open a separate account, and we pay the bills. So thanks to Barb and Judy and those who will help with that effort, we were able to help this family resettle who have served and supported our people when in Afghan. So we're delighted to start that effort as well. Are there other announcements, joys, or concerns this day? Allison? Hi, uh, my name is Allison Forrest, and um, this is just a big thank you to my St. Peter's family. Okay, I'm not going to be able to get through it, but um, thank you all for supporting me and my family. Um, I, on August 10th, had both my kidneys removed and a transplant from my brother. Uh, my brother's birthday is tomorrow, so I just want everyone to say thank you to him. And I want to say thank you to everyone here who helped um, make meals for my family, take care of my gardens, um, to Robin Kennefick, because she took in the teenager that is living with us, who's coming from a troubled home. She took him in and took care of him, and so that put my mind at ease that he had a safe place to be while we were out in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic to have the surgery done. Um, so I just am so grateful for everyone, and I just have to tell you, 
as I was being wheeled into the operating room, I had such a feeling of peace um, and calm that came over me, and I felt like I could feel everyone's hands on me. And I just am so grateful for all of you for that, because I thought I'd be freaking out at that point. <laughs> but um, I said a thank you to my huge, disgusting old kidneys that they had given me my two kids and 50 years of life. And then I said, now go away. <laughs> I'm ready for my new young one to come in. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, we really couldn't have done this without you. And um, I'm back. I'm at about 90% now. So you'll be seeing more of me. And um, just thank you everyone for all of your caring, your prayers, and your love. I really felt it even all the way in Minnesota. So thank you. And Allison, you gave us a gift by allowing us to care for your family when you were having your kidney transplant. So it allowed us to also, it, it lifted us up, your witness and your, your journey that's been going for several years now to finally take this last part of the chapter has been a witness and a blessing to us all. So thank you as well. Now, my brothers and sisters, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. We will be singing hymn number 424 for the fruit of all creation as we prepare for the Eucharist. continues with Eucharistic Prayer A. The Lord be with you. And also with Lift up your hearts. To the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, 
and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of eternal life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food of drink, food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. of God given for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite you to come to the center of
invite you to turn to page 366 as we pray together our post-communion prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. And Bishop Curry will give us the blessing. The blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with each of you and remain with you forever. Amen. Now let us join our final song, number 372, two, Praise to the Living God. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 